Hey, it's Coach Taylor from SmarterTeamTraining.com. I'm going to tell you once again, and it has to be uh, week 8, 9, or 10 in a row that I've told you guys uh, to use social media to reach out and network with like-minded individuals and people who think differently. Uh, I got a guy on the phone, a phone here named Mike Robertson. Uh, I've checked that stuff out on Twitter, and uh, lo, lo and behold, we just went back and forth a couple times on email, and I just said, hey, man, can we get on the phone? Uh, I know we got a couple guys that we know in common throughout the industry as we've been networked and, and that type of thing, and I know people have, have spoke very highly of him uh, as a person and a practitioner in our field. So I wanted to get him on the show, and, and Mike and I have not talked on the phone leading up to this conversation. We got on the phone seven minutes ago, maybe less, and I filled him in about the show in the background, and then we're going to go into this conversation. So the people on, on the show here that are listening to the show, uh, if you reach out to the great ones on our field, the really, really good ones on our field, and have organized thoughts and, and organized questions, uh, they're going to make time. They're not going to find time. They're going to make time uh, to give back to, to the other people in our field that are up and coming, uh, or even people that are just uh, just willing to reach out and just share a little bit of what they got going on in their life. And uh, uh, the great ones do that. And, and I will tell you, if you reach out to somebody and they're not responding back to you, uh, you might want to look for a different mentor, in my opinion. And, and that is all on me. That is not on Mike uh, uh, as far as that goes, that is on me. If someone reaches out to to, to anybody and they're not responding back, um, do me a favor. Give me a buzz. Shoot me an email, and uh, and I'll try to follow up and find out what the deal is, and then I'll point you in the direction of 17 or 18 other people that you should contact and ask questions about. So, uh, hey, Mike, man, I, one, starting off the bat here, I appreciate the opportunity to just go back and forth on email with you. Uh, it's really cool to see what you share on Twitter, and, and I'll keep pounding that for you a little bit here in the show. Um, and and I'm, I'm just looking forward to talking shop, my man, to be honest with you. Hey, well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it and uh, happy to be here today. Mike, obviously, uh, I've gone on the website and I've done a little bit of homework as far as your bio. And, and to say I know everything you've done in your career uh, would be a lie. Uh, but I, I really don't care what you did in 1999. We talked about that a little bit before the show got started. I'm not a big, like, hey, tell me all your bio. I want to know about you as a person, uh, where your passion comes from. I think that is what really drives people in our field. They, they are passionate people about helping others. And I really want to know, you know, what gets you up in the morning, gets you excited to go to work, and, and tell me a little bit about what you have going on now, my man. I won't go back to 1999, but uh, I will go back to 1994 for one second because that's the year I first started working out. And for me personally, I was, you know, a pretty good athlete, but not like an elite athlete. And for me, I always wanted somebody to help guide me with regards to physical preparation, whether it was speed, strength, power, conditioning. I wanted to be a great basketball player. I loved working out, but I never really had someone to guide me in that regard. So I think that's what really led me to this industry and led me to working with athletes because I always wanted a coach that could help me get the most out of my own body. And growing up, I didn't have that. So that's why I continue to do this to this day. I just love working with athletes. I love helping them get better, and I love helping them see how far they can take their bodies and their performance. Like I was doing some research, and I'll be honest with you again, man, I had my staff do a couple things. We had a big intern group here in the summer, and uh, I just said, hey, just do me a favor. Just Google some stuff, and let's have some conversations about it. And they must have came up with probably about uh, 60 different topics that, that uh, everybody wanted to cover. <laughs> and, and, the, and the one that uh, kind of struck me, and, and in no particular order, to be very fair, and, and uh, for, again, the, for the listeners on this, I've sent like a couple different topics that we'll – uh, discuss and if we get to them great and if we don't and and uh go, go from that kind of uh, scenario uh one i wanted to talk about was neutral spine and, and uh i i think it's really cool uh the way you described it and some other things and again get people to just think as if there is no box not in or out but as if there is no box i want you to do do me a favor can you expand on this concept of neutral spine uh as a range rather than a static position and then do me a favor, walk me through what is a healthy range. Uh, how are you defining or, or using that terminology? Uh, we talk about visual cueing a lot. Uh, how, how are you actually implementing that in, in the practical sense in your training? And how has it helped your uh, clients and athletes? The best way to understand neutral spine is if you learn anatomy like me, you went to courses, you looked at textbooks, and our understanding of what we think neutral spine is, and it's this perfect spinal position that you see in a book. It never moves. It never strays from that posture. And we all know that that's not reality. That's not sport. That's not life. And when you're dynamic, when you're moving, things are going to change. So the way I try to think about a neutral spinal position or that range of neutral spine is that, you know, there's a healthy range that your spine should have. Uh, there's a, a, a specific area or zone that your body should be in when you're squatting, when you're deadlifting, when you're working on running mechanics or any 
any big bang movement. But ultimately, the further you stray from that neutral zone, if you will, I think the more likely you are to break down or get injured. Also, the more likely you are to see decrements in your performance. So if you're running around with a really extended back, you know, chances are you're not going to run as fast. You're not going to jump as high. You're not going to squat as much weight because now, you know, not all the right muscles are working. You're not as efficient. So if I have like a core philosophy, it's always coming back to this idea of efficiency and trying to make athletes that are resilient, they're strong, they don't break down, um, and quite simply are very, very efficient and effective in their movement. So while I don't think there is this mythological neutral spine posture that is perfect and never changing, there is absolutely a zone that we all work in to create movement, to lift weights, and to perform sport at a high level. When we talk about our program design, generally speaking, and I'm just talking to meats and potatoes, we talk about push and pull uh, as far as uh, we could do, if you want to call it two chest sets back to back, or we might go a chest to a, a back to a chest to a back, uh, vertical to horizontal, those types of things. And the one thing that really caught our crew's eye was uh, the concept that you talked about reaching and rowing. I mean, how did you how do you go about programming upper body movements uh, into reaching and rowing? I just want to know if our terminology is the same and we're just calling it two different things. And then how has it helped your clients and athletes uh, stay healthy? Yeah, great question. The way I describe reaching versus rowing, a rowing is any movement where the scapula are retracted or pinned back. Now, beyond just rowing, in a lot of respects, this is the position your, your scapula or your shoulder blades are in when you're bench pressing. So while you're using the chest muscles, the triceps, the shoulders to help you press, from a scapular stability perspective, it's very row-ish, okay? And I know it's not a great analogy, but it's very much like a row in the fact that your shoulder blades are pinned back and down. So something that I really try and focus on with my athletes is this balancing of rowing and reaching. So a reach would be any exercise where you're actively protracting the scapula or trying to open up that area in between the shoulder blades. Some examples here would be push-up variations. It could be landmine pressing variations or even overhead pressing variations. And the key distinction here is you're actively thinking about reaching long, whether it's reaching through your arm, reaching through, or pushing your body away from the floor. Those types of movements actually fundamentally are totally different in how your brain perceives them because now your shoulder blades aren't pinned back and down or they're not thinking about being squeezed together, but you're actually thinking about pushing away from the ground or pushing away from whichever object you're lifting. And what ends up happening, you get a ton of serratus involvement, which is huge. We know serratus is critical if you want to keep your shoulders healthy. It's also really helpful for restoring your center of gravity because a lot of the athletes and a lot of the people we work with are stuck in a very extended posture. And uh, You're going to see an anterior pelvic tilt. You're going to see a overextended or hyperextended lumbar spine. So when you teach people to reach, what you'll naturally see is this shifting back of their center of gravity. The lower portion of the rib cage comes down, the abs turn on, so it's not only effective for shoulder health, but I find reaching is actually critically important if you want to keep your core and your lower extremity healthy as well. As I get a chance here to work in the private sector, I'm getting a chance to work with more and more youth athletes. Uh, my background is predominantly college, pro, and international level uh, athletes, and, and true athletes uh, with a, a paid sport, uh, a paid job. Uh, that revolves around throwing or catching a ball, for that matter. Uh, but as we're working in with the youth model more and more and more, uh, I'm trying to reach out to more people and ask them, uh, do you program for your youth athletes differently than you do for your adults? Uh, what protocols might be similar or different? And, and how are you really addressing potentially uh, you know, the, the everyday grind of the youth schedule athletically? Yeah, it's tough because so many of these kids are they're already in the beat grinder right? Whether they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, they're already in the grinder that is uh, competitive sport. And it's frustrating as a practitioner because, you know, we just want what's best for our kids. So what we tend to do is whenever possible, we break our kids up. So kind of that six to nine, six to ten age range, we're very focused. If they're going to come into our gym, they, we have a specific class for them. We just call it our kids class or our youth athletic development class. And really, it's structured play. We're going to go in, we're going to do some dynamic stretching, we're going to do some of the ABCs that Isvan Bali talks about, agility, balance, coordination, could be walking on a two-by-four, could be jumping rope, could be skipping patterns, bear crawling, but then we're just going to play games, 
we're going to create random games, or more importantly, we're going to let them create games that they can play so that they can learn more about their body. From there, kind of in that 11 to 13 year old age range, now we're going to start to make it a little bit more structured. We're still going to do the, the dynamic warm up, we're still going to do the ABCs, but now we're maybe adding in some elements of actual movements. So it could be things that look like a squat or look like a hinge or a lunge or a push up. So we're starting to teach them in a more structured manner how to move their bodies more effectively. And then from there, once they get to 13, 14, 15 years old, now we're very comfortable teaching them the lifts. But the big thing that you're going to see is we're always trying to find the right exercise for the, the child in front of us. So back in the day, you know, even 14, 15 year old kids, I had no issue putting a barbell on their back. Nowadays, that may not be the most appropriate choice right off the bat. I may start with a goblet squat or a two kettlebell front squat and grow from there. So I think the big thing is to try and give younger kids uh, the freedom of expression, the ability to play, to learn more about their bodies. And then as they grow and as they mature, then we start to make exercise a little bit more formal so that we can start to give them what we know that they need movement-wise. As we're doing our homework here, one uh, topic, I guess, that uh, kind of caught our eye, and, and I have a little bit of a different interpretation of this this concept of uh, in our field of sports-specific training, uh, or, or SST, if you want to call it that. Uh, how do you define sports-specific training? Uh, do you consider yourself a guy who implements sports-specific training? And then if you could just pick a sport and just walk me through a little bit of what, what, uh, what or how you're implementing sports-specific training for your athletes. Well, I'll tell you first and foremost that we tell every parent that comes in our gym that we do sports-specific training. And whether it's what they think it is, you know, it may not be agility drills with a soccer ball or agility drills with a volleyball. We absolutely teach our athletes how to move well how to move appropriately for their sport. So that's a crucial distinction. Uh, I think a lot of people in our industry, they get annoyed by the term or they hate when parents or what they would consider uninformed people use that term. But we absolutely use that term. And we're going to tell parents, yes, we're volleyball specific or we're soccer specific. But when you strip it down, athletic movement is athletic movement. And whether it's moving in a straight-ahead fashion, an acceleration posture, top-end speed, whether it's lateral agility, crossover stepping, any of those movements, those are athletic movements, and they are respective of their sports. So this is something that we could go you know, to war about with a lot of different people, and people love to use the term, but quite simply, we're going to tell parents that we do sports-specific training. We feel that we do sports-specific training, even though we know in our hearts that the way we do things is just teaching people how to move athletically in a fluid and seamless fashion. So what you tell people uh, and what you actually do doesn't have to be disingenuous. But at the end of the day, if we teach people to move well and move efficiently, chances are it's going to carry over to their sport. One big part of our programming, and we do it early in every training session, uh, we call it weak links. And, and we identify relative to a sport or even to an individual uh, where they might be weak, and it could be related, related to the ankle, the knee, the hip, the low back, uh, even the thoracic spine. It could be a rotator cuff. Uh, it could be grip or finger related. It could even neck, head, upper, head, neck, upper back, even jaw. Uh, it's very important for us to kind of identify some areas that people just need to work on, and, and we consider that a weak link of the body. We do that before we ever get into a bench press or a squat. It, it's very important that we do it first, not last, in, in my opinion. How do you address weak links of the body either individually uh, as a group, uh, do you look at a sports or even, uh, even by position? Uh, are you doing it before or after? Or, or is it one of those things that just everything is a corrective exercise and uh, just strength training alone can take care of it all? Yeah, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I think, again, by and large, human beings are human beings. Uh, there are certain areas or patterns of breakdown that you're going to see in different sports. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to come back to most athletes, are going to be weak when it comes to their reaching pattern. So their serratus is typically going to be weak. They're going to be rhomboid dominant. They're going to have a tendency to carry their shoulder blades back and down. So we're going to train the serratus a lot. We're going to teach them to reach effectively. Probably the biggest issue that you're going to see is poor abdominal and core development. Again, lots of athletes, lots of lay people nowadays, huge anterior pelvic tilt, huge extended lumbar spine. They need abs. They desperately need abs. And actually, the starting point of almost all of our core training begins with proper breathing. We're going to teach our clients and our athletes to exhale effectively so that we start in a better position. And then last but not least, hamstrings. 
Um, hamstrings are hugely important, whether you're talking about uh, lower back issues, hip issues, knee issues. So teaching athletes to recruit and effectively utilize their hamstrings are going to be critical. But I think the big thing that we have to focus on, don't just think about muscles, but think about joint positions. Because if you can get a joint in the proper position, then naturally the right muscles are much more likely to fire. I would like to talk a little bit about the concept of strength and, and maybe even some of the limiting factors. Uh, I, I believe we, we don't use wrist wraps. We don't use belts. Uh, you know, you do the whole concept. You don't use straps or belts on the field, that type of thing. And then I work in an environment with kids that uh, we can kind of use as a, a little bit of a, what do you want to call it, a tagline, a little bit of a toughness thing. And we got a great, make our hands stronger, that type of gig. Uh, but we also have some athletes that, uh, that their goal is to become extremely strong, whether they're power lifters, football players, you know, above and beyond the normal uh, just fitness type people. I mean, what are limiting factors to developing strength and, and how are you addressing them, again, through their conditioning and fitness, possibly uh, gri grip strength, or even, again, addressing some of those weak links? Yeah, I think the big thing you see when somebody is not as strong as they should be, there's a couple things you can look at. Number one is technique. And I know this is not the sexy answer, but when somebody has proper technique and they're using it consistently when they train, chances are they're going to get stronger. And this may be the biggest limiting factor, because you watch some people that you think, wow, this person should be really strong, their technique is awful, and as a result, they break down. So technique is number one. Number two, again, joint position. If you can't use the right muscles at the right time, ultimately you're going to hold yourself back. Um, and it could be just uh, an efficiency issue that we alluded to before, or it could be what we see a lot of times is people just break down. If you're hyperextending your lower back to create stability every time you squat or deadlift, Chances are, over time, you're either going to have a sore back, a sore knee, or a sore hip as a result. So technique, efficiency, or, or po starting posture are hugely important. And then the last one, again, it's not sexy, but just consistency. Because a lot of times people read the articles now, you know, four weeks to a bigger bench press. Well, that sounds great, but we all know that the big lifts, they take time to grow and develop. The squat, the bench, the deadlift, you're going to have ups and downs, peaks and valleys. And if you've ever sported, competed in the sport of powerlifting, you know how true this is. You know, like when you start off, all three lifts are going up. And then as you compete longer and longer, it's like, hey, if you got two out of three lifts going up, you're doing pretty well. And, you know, the, the stronger you get, it's like, hey, if I've even got one lift going up, like I'm making progress. So consistency and dedication are, are again, they're not a sexy answer, but they're absolutely true. If you want to get truly strong, it's going to take years of dedication. If you sent me your strength program, your conditioning program, and we can go either way, so I'm going to give you some freedom here, uh, and, and it could relate to a youth model, it could use, and I'll use that middle school, high school range, uh, college, college athlete range, uh, even a, potentially a pro player, even though very few people get a chance to interact with that. So if we can ignore that one for a second, that's fine. And then let's talk about the, the 35, 45, 55-year-old individual that a lot of us get a chance to work with as well in the private sector. Uh, do you have lists that you avoid or encourage in your program for those different age, age ranges? Again, are there similarities? Are there differences? I mean, one big thing that is important to us is strengthening the head, neck, and upper back and the jaw for almost every one of those, I shouldn't say almost, for all of those age ranges, and we do do it differently. But that's important to us uh, to encourage in each other's program, uh, obviously taking out any type of cervical injury or those types of things. But are there things that you encourage or avoid in your program? Yeah, I think the big thing that we encourage is total body athleticism. And that's true regardless of whether we're working in, with an 8, 9, or 10-year-old child or an 88-year-old woman. And, you know, we've got an 88-year-old woman in our gym who actually throws a med ball because we want her to be powerful. We need to teach her how to squat effectively. So beyond just training the different facets of athleticism, whether it's power or strength or conditioning, one of our key tenets is that everybody should be able to do the basic movements. Right? So we want people to be able to squat. We need them to be able to deadlift. We want them to launch. We want them to push up. Because these are key or fundamental movement patterns that everybody should have. Now, with that being said, that doesn't mean everybody does the exact same lift or with the same degree of intensity. If I've got an NFL caliber athlete, they're going to trap bar, and they're probably going to push a fair amount of weight. But in that same breath, if I have a 13-year-old athlete, I want to teach them how to hinge or deadlift effectively. And the same thing goes for a 60- or 70-year-old client that we have in our gym. They may not use the same load, 
they may not even trap bar. We may find a uh, kettlebell deadlift where we've really raised it up to a high degree where we've minimized the mobility demands. We may find that's the best option for them. But ultimately, we think that everybody is an athlete. We're going to teach them all to move well, and we're going to teach them the basic movement patterns, keeping in mind that we can always control the range of motion we use, the weight that we use, and the speed at which we execute the lift. I like to talk about accommodating resistance. I don't care if you want to talk about bands or chains. Again, I'll give you that freedom. Uh, it's something that we do on a couple of different pieces in our gym. Uh, barbell stuff, we're normally using band uh, or chain, even though we try to lean toward chain stuff uh, to break up the day on our Friday fun day kind of workouts. And then we also have a bunch of equipment that we can actually incorporate banded training into uh, the accommodated resistance or even just the protocol that we use moving forward. I mean, are you using or incorporating resistance band training or even change, for that matter, uh, into your training? Uh, if so, how are you taking advantage and, and using it effectively? Uh, how important is accommodative resistance in your program? Yeah, I think for a lot of your younger athletes, it's probably overkill. Uh, I think Joe Ken, who's one of my closest friends in the industry and somebody that I really deeply respect, I don't think he uses accommodating resistance until he's had an athlete for four or five years. So that tells you something because he's working with either Division One or collegiate level football players, so guys that are very experienced in the weight room. With my own experience, I absolutely use them. Uh, it's typically going to be late in the training cycle, so we're going to use it as part of a power phase or we're going to use it to really help peak power going into a preseason or going into a competitive block. Uh, but we absolutely use them. It's just uh, I have to be somewhat judicious in who I select uh, as worthy of using that method because it's not for everybody. Not everybody is skilled enough technically. Not everybody is prepared uh, strength-wise or movement-wise for those lifts. So they're absolutely great. I just think we need to be judicious in who we use them with. I get asked quite often uh, about, um, you know, how, how can we go about gaining more experience in the field? And then I'm sure you're in the same boat. We kind of, we get emails or uh, it could be text messages. It could be, it could be on Twitter. Uh, just how can we become better in this field? And you could have a sophomore or a junior in college uh, or even someone who's 35, 40, you know, looking to change their profession and, uh, and get into our field. And one of the big things they ask is what can we do to really enhance? I mean, what certification, what kind of degree, uh, those, what courses, that type of thing. And I always think you're going back to getting in the trenches and working on uh, gaining experience and being mentored by a coach and actually having somebody over your shoulder give you some information. I mean, how has your experience at Ball State uh, helped your programming in the private sector? Yeah, great question. Look, there's no course you can attend. There's no book you can read that's going to make up for a lack of practical experience. So by all means, read the books. Go to the courses. I mean, whether it's a course that we have or Perform Better or, you know, Central Virginia has great courses. The Seattle Sounders have great courses. Uh, Boston Sports Med, great courses. But it doesn't make up for a lack of experience. And, again, you said not to go way back, but I'm going to tell you, when I got into this field, I did an internship at Ball State. I spent three months, I believe it was, in our athletic weight room there. And then the next two years, I was doing my graduate assistant work. But literally that whole year in between my first and second year, so that whole first year of graduate level work, I'm doing research in the lab on data mining and putting people on force plates. But as soon as I'm done, I'm down in the athletic weight room. And I was volunteering at that point. I wasn't getting, I mean, I didn't get paid the whole time I was there, but I didn't have any teams. I just loved working with the athletes and I loved the relationships that I built during the time of my internship. So I spent a ton of time down there. And the next year, my second year, I'm still doing the graduate assistant work, but now I got more responsibility. I was assistantly, essentially an assistant strength coach because I programmed for our men's volleyball team, our women's volleyball team. I was actively helping out with our football team, with our powerlifting team. So I just knew that this was something I was passionate about, something that I wanted to pursue as a career, and I wasn't going to let anything hold me back from that. So I think the best advice I could give them is, like, just find somebody to work with. You can't tell me that somebody is going to turn away free labor. So that's what I would say. Get in the gym, find somebody to help you, mentor you, and just get your reps in as a coach because over time, you'll undoubtedly get better and better at it. In our society, I don't know if nutrition or, or proper eating habits is a lack of education any longer. I think there's plenty of information out there saying, uh, I 
don't give it what kind of quote unquote diet, if you want to call it that, you're on, or, or if you're looking for protein, macronutrient information, or I think it's very easy to find if you go on Google and just look something up. Uh, so I don't know if it's necessarily a lack of information. I think it's a lack of implementation. I mean, how can we change diet and dieting to make them more likely to be a lifestyle change? I mean, somebody's got to commit to making a, a better decision in the grocery store so that it's not readily available on their countertop when they come home and they can dip into the bag of Oreos. I mean, how are you approaching nutrition with your clients and really helping them make lifestyle changes that aid and, and hopefully help with their strength conditioning and, and goal-meeting challenges? If you're getting people in the private sector, it, it's absolutely an implementation issue because a lot of these people are fairly well-educated, but there's a handful of athletes that I've worked with over the years, especially as professionals that that came from very humble beginnings, and quite simply, they are not educated on the topic of nutrition. Uh, their parents uh, are typically very poor. They're not well, well uh, educated on the topic of nutrition or how to fuel the body for performance. So whether it is uh, a low-income family or a high-income family, I think the starting point is education and helping these people better understand how proper nutrition is going to help them athletically, how it's going to help them cognitively. Uh, if they're younger, if it's at school. I mean, I've had kids, 16-year-old kids, that I would get at a 3 o'clock practice, and the only thing they'd had for, for food or fuel the whole day is a Mountain Dew. So I think education is huge. And then when you talk about implementation, I think it's finding their weak links with regards to their nutrition. So whatever is holding them back, maybe it's eating breakfast. Maybe it's hydration. You try and find those weak links, and you start implementing one task or one behavior at a time. And, and John Berardi's done a great job with that, with the Precision Nutrition course. If you go in and you find the one thing that they really think that they can do and be successful with, you start there, you attack that, just like you would in the gym. If somebody's got a weak core, you attack that weakness, and you bring it up, and then you go to the next one. Same thing with diet or nutrition. Find the one thing that you feel like you can make a positive impact with, improve it, and then go on to the next item. Well, Mike, I know you're a busy guy, and for the listeners here, we're doing this in the middle part of a day. Uh, it's going between the early part of training and then obviously teams and everything else coming in from me, and I know Mike's got a, a busy schedule as well. So uh, I don't want to keep you on the, on the phone too long here, but if somebody was listening to this conversation that was uh, very young in our field here, uh, or maybe, again, they're, they're looking to just go over the hump and they need something to really give them a little bit of motivation or inspiration, I mean, can you tell me a little bit about – what drives you or, or what kind of message you would like to share with others uh, or maybe even a message that was told to you that really helped uh, elevate your uh, commitment to this field? You know, if I could just provide people with one piece of information, it's that, you know, I did not have like an ideal start in this, in this industry. Uh, again, the internship that I went through uh, the, the first year, I really, I just, I don't even know if the people liked me that I was standing around, you know, or I just kept going because I was passionate about it. And I wanted to be better at it. And I think the thing that has distinguished me over the years, and not to sound self-gratifying, but, you know, I just won't give up. I'm going to continue to read. I'm going to continue to learn. I'm going to continue to put myself in a position to be successful. And I think even as somebody at a young age, uh, I always looked at the long ball picture. I wasn't thinking about where am I going to be in three months? Where am I going to be at in six months? It's always, what can I do in five years, 10 years, 15 years, if I continue to work hard, if I continue to get in the gym and coach athletes, if I continue to go out and teach, if I continue to go out and educate myself, whether it's seminars, webinars, DVDs, podcasts, I just think that too often we fall short because we don't believe enough in ourselves, we don't see the big picture, and ultimately we just stop. We lose momentum and we stop. So if I could give you one piece of advice, it's keep grinding every day. Get in the gym, coach somebody every day. Pick up a book, watch a video on YouTube, like a high quality video, not just some guy lifting weights. You know, find ways to educate yourself, to grow, evolve as a coach, as a human being. And I guarantee you're going to be successful. There's no way you can't be. If you continue to get up, put your time in over the years, you're going to become someone to be reckoned. Mike, man, with us touching on a bunch of topics here, I'm sure someone's going to have a question, and, and I'm hoping I can uh, give you some of those emails uh, ahead of your way, not just coming to my inbox. Uh, <laughs> if someone wanted to reach out to you, my man, and, and uh, ask you anything, whether it's a mentorship-type scenario 
uh, maybe become an intern or find out how they can be involved with what you have going on. Uh, do me a favor. Just how can they reach out to you directly and find out more information about what, what you have going on? Absolutely. Well, the best way is just through my website, which is Robertson Training Systems with an S dot com. Robertson Training Systems dot com. So you can find out a ton about me there. You can contact me through the website. That's probably the best place. If you're interested in interning with us, ifastonline.com is our gym. Again, that's ifastonline.com. Um, Twitter, obviously, which is how we connected, robtrainsystems.com, I believe it is. But, yeah, any way you guys can find me, I'm happy to reach out to connect and to uh, hopefully, if possible, point you in the right direction. Again, I'll speak on Rob's behalf, or excuse me, uh, Mike's behalf here. Speaking of Rob's behalf. Speaking on Mike's <laughs> behalf, uh, Again, I sent him an email, and it was roughly 15, maybe 20 minutes, and I got an instant email back, and, and it kind of just added up, and uh, it turned into a really cool conversation. So, again, the, the great ones will make time uh, for anyone who just reaches out, and it doesn't have to be a situation where you put them on a podcast. You might just have one or two simple questions uh, about motivation or determination, or, I mean, I just took a whole page of notes. I mean, it could be anything as it relates to this, and I, I know Mike's doing a great job giving back to uh, our field with the incredible content as well. Uh, do me a favor. Do a little bit of research, man. Uh, check out a YouTube clip. I mean, I thought that was hilarious. Um, and then, then have a, a legitimate question to ask Mike or myself and, and just reach out to individuals in this field. The great ones will find time. Uh, the, the, the really outstanding individuals in our field, and they're very, there are a ton of them, will make time in their busy schedules uh, to give back and reply to any email, social media outlets, um, I'm going to put it on the listeners here. If you want more, uh, become more. Uh, and on that again, uh, Mike, man, I, I really appreciate the opportunity here to talk with you, my man. Uh, hopefully this is a launching pad for us to do many more things down the road. I'm looking forward to learning even more from you, and uh, I'm hopefully we're just going to keep in touch from here on out, my man. I love it. Thanks a ton for having me, Rob. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you're listening in, I hope you got something out of this.